I call this committee of the House Ways. I call this meeting of the House Ways and Means Committee to order and note for the uh, record that a quorum is present. And the first order of business is the approval of the minutes from Monday, April third, twenty twenty-three. Representative Nash, have you had a chance to review those minutes? It looks like you. They look you, great, Madam Chair. Yeah. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So, Representative Nash moves the approval of the minutes from Monday, April third, twenty twenty-three. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say no. The motion prevails, and the minutes are adopted. And so. Um, Today we have five bills up and we have a hard stop at 430 for caucus and other things tonight as well. And so we can come back from 630 until sundown, but I'm hope I'm hopeful we could get through these bills. Uh, today it's a lot of procedural work. We're going to have three different, well, uh, depending on how we count the pensions bill, but we'll have the climate and energy and the environment and natural resources budget bills. And we'll be starting today with some of the combining to match up with the Senate and the conference committee structures. And so for those that have been on Ways and Means before, you will remember some of this procedural uh, motions we need to make that uh, to get these bills merged. And so it'll be a little atypical in terms of we'll start with laying the primary bill over, um, or laying the first bill we hear over, hearing the primary vehicle bill, and then merging the bills. So it'll be a little bit different in terms of procedural motions but uh, we also have the chance that each will have be able to be voted on separately before they're merged for the final vote as well. So that I know in the past that has been something that the minority party has asked for. So we will make sure to keep that, uh, keep that procedurally done in the same way so that there's that chance for a separate vote. And so our first bill today is House File 313100, the Pensions Bill, Representative Herr. And so I will move that House file 3100 be placed on the general register. And you have which uh, a DE2 amendment for your bill. So would you, I will move the DE2 amendment. And there is an A2 amendment to the DE2. Would you like to do that first? Yes, Madam Chair, if I could, uh, if the, someone could move the A2 amendment and I can talk a little bit about what that is. It is actually just deleting Article 7, which is a secure choice piece of it. Okay. Um, and so that will just uh, will go on, on itself as a standalone bill. Okay, so I will move the A2 amendment, which Representative Herr just discussed. Any discussion to the A2 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails in the A2 amendment to the DE2 is adopted. So to the DE2 amendment as amended, uh, Representative Herr. Thank you, Chair Olson. And um, this actually is a really good bill, and it is a bipartisan bill. So the Secure Choice was the only piece that maybe there was a little bit of um, consternation uh, of having it in the bill. Um, even out of pensions, it passed unanimously with bipartisan support. Only one GOP from the House or the Senate voted against it. We are a bicameral body. And so this bill has large bipartisan support. And what it really does is that the bill just looks at, um, you know, allocating the $600 million that was uh, targeted for, uh, the target that was given to the, the um, the Pensions Commission, and so we did call it. So Section 1, the Article 1, just talks about um, uh, uh, reducing the assumed rate of return, which we need to do that based on what the actuary has recommended to us. To cite Article 2 is COLA increases. Article 3 uh, deals with technical changes for the Minnesota State Retirement System. Article 4 is the Empl uh, in Public Employee Retirement Association changes there. And uh, Article 5 is specifically to the St. Paul Teachers Retirement. And then Article 6 uh, uh, speaks to the appropriations for each of the uh, different plans. And so now with Article 7, the Secure Choice moved out. It's just really uh, technical pieces of how the, uh, the funds were allocated between the different um, pension plans within uh, the commission's purview. So that's really the gist of the bill. And like I said before, it is, uh, it does, uh, it is uh, a bill that has bipartisan support. And so I can answer any questions people may have on the bill. Thank you, Representative Hurt. So discussion to the DE2 amendment as amended. Lead Garoppolo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, Representative Hurt, thank you for carrying this bill. And also, thank you for providing a caveat on the bill that this one is actually a good bill, <laughs> unlike the other ones. We, we, uh, this side of the aisle appreciates that. Um, we've received a lot of correspondence in the legislature regarding, I believe it's House File 1234. Mm -hmm. Can you just provide some context from a fiscal perspective on that for members of the committee? I know we've gotten lots of communications. Um, you sent an email update out during the Easter, Easter recess, but just 
for members who may not have seen them. Representative Hurt. Chair Olson, Representative Garofalo, thank you for that question. So House, uh, House 51234 it will be, is moving separately, but the uh, funding for it is in our budget. So there is a hundred and about $4 million that is, has been set aside in order to fund that particular bill. And that bill actually just uh, looks at the, uh, the, uh, the uh, addressing the duty disability uh, for our officers to ensure that that plan uh, stays um, healthy for our future police officers in order for them to be able to, you know, use the benefits or retire one day as well. And really addressing to ensure that um, officers actually get uh, the health care that they deserve and they need um, regarding PTSD from the job. And so uh, and it's creating a system that allows them to be able to get the services they need and the care that they need and also then the benefits that they need during those time periods. Lead Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Herr, um, I know with pension bills, a lot of these things are come to us, they're consensus oriented. Um, one of the concerns I have is that uh, despite the, the, the fact that our pension funds are not at 100%, we're still seeing some benefit increases in there in terms of the one-time COLA adjustments. Can you, for the advocates who advert, um, supported that, can you provide some context for the arguments they made for why we're doing that despite the fact that we're not, the pensions aren't yet fully funded? Representative Herr. Chair also Representative Graffle, thank you for that question. That's a good question. So actually the COLA increases are one-time COLA increases. And so uh, it's, it will only happen um, just this, this time. We don't have any future, we don't make any structural changes with this bill, except for the one to St. Paul teachers, which actually they're paying for, we put some funding from this target into that, but then they're paying for the extra increase for their teachers for, in the St. Paul plan. But otherwise, none of the provisions in this plan create structural changes that will have ongoing costs. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any further discussion? Representative O'Neill, welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Just really quickly, so there, there's a provision in the higher ed bill that's coming up next, that's a TRA. Is there any um, coordination or interplay between the higher ed bill and that change to TRA and, and what your bill is doing? Representative Her. Chair Olson, uh, Representative O'Neill, um, you know, I, I was in initial discussions with uh, Speaker and uh, Chair Joachim on that, but I didn't know that it was actually had our, it had been included because that is separate from uh, our bill. So um, whatever happens within that particular piece of the bill uh, won't impact the, our omnibus pension bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, the DE2 as amended is before us. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the DE2 as amended has been adopted. So to House File 3100 as amended, any further discussion? Representative Her, last word. Oh, sorry, I started getting ready to leave, Reverend <laughs> Carolson. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. No, I appreciate the support uh, from uh, Ways and Means, um, you know, and hoping to have further discussion with anybody who might have specifics. I think that, uh, Represent uh, Chair Olson, can I just make a cl quick clarification for Representative O'Neill's question? Because I think I might have misunderstood it. Sure. And I did get a little bit of a clarification here that um, what she was referring to was, and, I'm, and maybe I'm wrong, but it was referring to the IRAP increase. Is that correct? Or was that a different piece that you were thinking of? Uh, Representative O'Neill. Sorry, I almost answered, but I stopped myself. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it is, yeah, it's in with the section, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head now, with unemployment insurance, and there's a change um, to increase a little bit of the employer part of TRA um, as it relates to hired institutions. So it's, I believe it's all three of the institutions, but we have the chair here, maybe he can speak to it, but I was just wondering if, if you and Chair Plowski maybe had talked about that provision in the higher ed bill re relating to TRA. Madam Chair, uh, Madam Chair, I'm looking at it right now. It, it, I think it's what you want, page 49, section 28. Uh, we're carrying it in this bill just for clarification because it deals with higher ed employees. Mm -hmm. So that's why the language is in the higher ed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Her. That that is it, Chair Olson. Thank you. And Representative, we can always talk offline too because the I think the IRAP bills were heard in pensions. So mm -hmm. if there's specific details, we can we can definitely talk about that. But thank you for giving us the opportunity to have the bill in front of you, and I look forward to the support. So I renew my motion that House File 3100, as amended, be placed on the general register. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. No. The motion prevails and the bill is on the general register. Thank you, Representative Hurt.
So the next bill is House File 2754, Representative Acom. And so this is this bill, as I did mentioned, this bill is going to be temporarily laid over until we hear the environment budget bill. And then we'll be bringing this back up to merge together to match the Senate committee structure. So we're going to be begin that process now. So I will move that House File 2754 be before the committee. And we have several amendments we'll take up. Would you like to do those first, Representative Acom? Yes, please. So I will move... Or Representative Acom will move the A16 amendment. And then you have a technical amendment that we just caught today, the A17 amendment to the A16 amendment. So Representative Acom moves the A17 amendment to the A16 amendment. Do you want to discuss the A17 technical amendment, please, Representative Acom? Thank you, Madam Chair. And yes, the A17 is just that. It's a technical amendment that um, lines up the appropriations piece with the spreadsheet. The, the numbers were on the spreadsheet. It was just a, a miss. Great. Any discussion to the A17 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the A-17 amendment is adopted. And so to the underlying A-16 amendment as amended, would you please describe your amendment, Representative Thank, Ecom? Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I will say the first part of this amendment, it seems like it's um, a hefty amendment. The first um, 21 pages is really just reordering um, the provisions to line up again with the spreadsheet. So it can be um, then the, the bill can be read in concert with the spreadsheet and it's not a lot of flipping back and forth. So there are some technical changes within there, um, very, very, very minor, nothing substantive. Um, and the, the major part of the change within the um, A16 is including a provision um, to um, codify an agreement between XL Energy and Prairie Island. Um, as you all know, the um, XL Energy nuclear, nuclear um, facility is um, very close to the Prairie Island Indian community. Um, we weren't able to uh, draft a bill for um, this agreement. That both parties came and testified um, when we did our bill um, in the last day of committee. And so, in essence, what the um, provision does is um, codify an agreement between the two entities um, recognizing that um, Prairie Island, um, given their proximity, shares some risks of, of living so close to the nuclear facility. And so um, what this arrangement does is um, XL Energy currently pays Prairie Island um, $2.5 million a year in the fuel clause, and it will up that amount to $10 million a year, um, which is um, the same payment amount that they make to um, Red Wing for property taxes and such. And so it's given the proximity, it's a um, felt like a justified amount. And then um, $2.5 million a year, a year will come from the renewable development account um, in terms of a cask fee. And it will be $50,000 per year per cask. Currently, there are 50 casks. So that works out to $2.5 million a year. Um, and that will go up as casks continue to accrue. And this is really an arrangement that is um, the first start of Excel looking to um, extend their nuclear license at um, Prairie Island, or excuse me, yes, at the Prairie Island facility. And um, so conversations with them. The, um, the, I will say the impact that it'll have on ratepayers for the increase of $10 million is about 17 cents a month. Um, per bill. And um, I've also been um, told that it will save money for ratepayers down the road in decommissioning costs. So it gives a longer off ramp to decommission the um, facility when it in fact does decommission. So with that, I am um, open to questions about that. Discussion to the A16 amendment. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Chair Acom, that we had a nice conversation before the meeting and before the hearing. I appreciate that. Um, in that conversation, I, I was kind of waiting for you to say it, but is this uh, agreement actually agreed upon or is this like a work in progress and this is kind of a, a placeholder for when the final agreement is actually done? Because I know there's concerns and I don't need to get into what what that is. I'm, you can say it if you like, but it just I know that there are concerns all over the board. 
So I'm just wondering if you could address that. Representative Acom. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative O'Neill. Yeah, so there are conversations that are continuing to happen, um, and the Senate may have a different um, take on this agreement, and ultimately it will be decided in conference, likely, um, but conversations will absolutely continue. And, um, you know, I think some parties want more um, renewable development money paid and um, you know there's a whole spectrum of ways that um, this could be figured out um, so it will con conversations will continue um, given the fact that we were coming to ways and means we felt an urgency to ensure that um, there was a, you know a placeholder within our bill recognizing how important it is that we um, make sure Prairie Island is um, taken care of. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Representative Acom. So you had kind of alluded to this, but this is um, really not the agreement, so to speak. There, there are concerns all over the board, and um, one of them would be that this is going, most of the, the bulk of the money is actually going to be borne by taxpayers, rate payers, I should say, excuse me, the rate payers of Excel Energy, which I am one. I live in that community. I live in Mon you know, near Monticello, near that plant. Mm -hmm. um, I guess one thing that you had said that I was a little bit curious about, and it, it goes to kind of the money and, and why we're doing this, is you had said that um, this is what it takes to extend the license. And maybe I mistook what you said, but are you saying that if the Prairie Island Indian community doesn't come to some kind of agreement with Excel Energy that the licensure cannot be extended? I'm not quite sure. I've, I've not heard this before, so if you could enlighten me. Representative Acom. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Representative. Maybe I misspoke. If that was how it came off, that wasn't what I intended. This was um, an agreement given the proximity um, of the Indian um, community to the nuclear plant. And so I think that as Excel, it starts to explore the opportunities to expand their licensure. I think they recognize the importance of um, having Prairie Island Indian community as a partner, and they recognize the challenges it would have by not having them as a partner. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I, I don't want to get too deep into this because this is ways and means, but you, you just said something that I, I hadn't heard before, and um, I've heard a lot about this particular um, conversation. Um, I'm also, I'm just, I guess I'm not really sure if you're going to put this language in, it's not agreed upon, it is a placeholder, what is going to happen after today when it hits the floor? Are you thinking that you're going to be drafting maybe another amendment for the floor? What's going to happen from here, do you think? Representative Acom. Thank you, Madam Chair. And what I will say is this is the House position. And so as we go into um, the bill passage and conferencing with the Senate, this is the House position. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, that's all I have for right now. Thank you. Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Acom, um, so your committee has an extremely generous target um, given the size of our budget surplus. I'm just wondering, in light of the fact that we have um, you know, an unprecedented amount of resources in the hands of government right now. Why are we relying on the ratepayers for this extra money as opposed to just using existing funds? Representative Acom. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Garofalo. Um, I think that this is um, this agreement was made between two entities, um, the tribe and um, the utility, and so I think putting state resources or the renewable development account, which was established to um, expand renewable energy to replace things like nuclear or fossil fuels that are dangerous and um, bring harm to our community. And so if we are, that's not necessarily, in my opinion and in um, our opinion, that is not the position or that's not the appropriate use of renewable development funds. And so, um, by agreeing to use a portion of them, um, we are compromising because we feel it's really important to ensure that um, Prairie Island Indian um, community is compensated appropriately. Thank you. Rep and Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Acom. <laughs> so 
Um, I certainly understand why this agreement is a good deal for Excel Energy and the Prairie Island Indian community. Um, from Excel Energy's perspective, they're getting more of a guarantee of preserving a, an asset that they will get a long-term uh, rate of return on. So it's a good deal for them. It's a good deal for their shareholders. From Prairie Island's perspective, I no criticism of them. I don't want to speak on their behalf, but my guess is they could they could care less where the money comes from as long as they get compensated. So this agreement between Excel and Prairie Island's a, a real good deal for them, but I'm just wondering if any have any ratepayer organizations come in and advocated and said this is a good deal for them? Is it the people who are paying the bills, does have any of them signed off on this or were they represented in these negotiations? Representative Acom. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative. Um, I would say there is, this is part of the process and the um, bill amendment included the language and we will continue to hear from um, people as they're made aware. Um, I think, as I said earlier, the um, impact on ratepayers, and I'm not in any way trying to minimize that, um, is will be 17 cents a month and um, in by, if the license is extended, um, it will save ratepayers money in um, the decommissioning costs. And this will not be paid if it is the license is not extended. Representative Grafwell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Akam, you, you correctly stated that when the these dry cask fees, this tax on nuclear power was created, uh, it was designed as part of a compromise to allow cask fees with the intent that that money would be used to fund alternatives to nuclear energy. Um, now with the passage of the carbon free bill early, earlier this year and now the extension of the relicensing, uh, the relicensing of the nuclear plant, it appears that that is no longer uh, the objective of some that in fact, and I think this is a good thing, that we're keeping these nuclear assets in our portfolio. That being said, these cask fees keep going up every year and they keep getting paid for by ratepayers. Um, right now, the, uh, the cask fees at Monticello are and uh, Prairie Island, what are what are they paying? What are ratepayers paying annually right now uh, on the for that those um, those costs? How much is that a uh, ratepayers paying? Representative Acom. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Garofalo. Um, so, um, for the Prairie Island uh, storage casks, they um, ratepayers pay five hundred thousand dollars a year, and there are fifty casks. So that math works out to $25 million. Um, in Monticello, they're paid $350,000 a year, and there are 30 casks, is that right? And so that works out to just over 11,000. I think the total is about $36 million in total. Um, there are some existing um, commitments to that fund, or to that amount, and so I think um, what is seen um, for our, from our perspective, is about 25 or 26 million dollars a year. Representative Grafwell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Aiken, just to be clear, the, so the ratepayers are paying 37 million. Uh, there may only be 22 or 24 million available for yes. legislators to spend, but that's what ratepayers are paying right now. As, and every year, that amount of money is going up. Um, just a, a, a concern I have, again, is that we see this change combined with the community solar gardens changes in the bill. We see the elimination of a sunset for an assessment on utility on uh, ratepayers in the bill. Uh, these things have a cumulative impact, and this is why Minnesota's electricity rates are rising faster than the rest of the nation, on average, than the rest of the nation. This is why people are paying more. And at a time of unprecedented resources in the hands of government, it would seem that there'd be very modest efforts we could undertake to actually be reducing costs of energy for those who are paying into the system, not those. So again, hats off to Excel and Prairie Island for making this agreement among themselves, but uh, this reminds me of uh, what we saw in the movie Office Space. Remember where they, everyone, uh, they figure out a way to take a little bit of money from everyone and they pull it together and I'm the only one who saw Office Space? Okay, all right. <laughs> And so what we're seeing here is a continual pattern, whether it's in the tax code, whether it's in our utility system, where we end up having everybody pay a little bit more, and then there are certain select people and entities that get preferred benefits out of it, whether it's the tax code or utilities or otherwise. So uh, I'm opposed to this amendment. I'm opposed to the increase, uh, the elimination of the sunset in the bill. I'm opposed to the community solar garden things. These are all things that are 100% paid by ratepayers. Uh, there's no shifting. There's no cost absorbed by others. And it's another example of going the wrong way. So I'm opposed to this. 
and would ask members to vote no. Thank you, Madam Chair. Further discussion to the A16 amendment. Representative Hornstein. Thanks, Madam Chair. I just, um, on 2517, uh, on page, yeah, line 17, page 25, talks about the extended operation of the plant. Uh, this would not supplant or change the normal licensing process that um, Excel would have to go through with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and all other PUC, all of these other entities that have to weigh in, correct? This is, that process is still in place for relicensing, correct? Representative Acom. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Hornstein. Absolutely, that process would still um, be required for the utility to go through, 100%. Thank you. Further discussion to the A16 amendment? Oh, Representative Novotny. Thank you, Chair. They uh, represent Elk River, which is part of Sherburn County, and before that uh, represented uh, Big Lake Township before redistricting, which is, as you know, right across the river from Monticello Power Plant should Sherburn County and Big Lake Township get a cut of what is paid for storage at Monticello. You can, you can see the power plant from our side of the river. Should they get a cut? Representative Acom. Thank you, um, Madam Chair and Representative. Um, I appreciate the question. I think it's a, a valid one. I think the um, proximity of Prairie Island and the community next to the nuclear plant and the storage is unprecedented across the country as far as the um, short distance it is away. Um, and I think out of that, a along with the history, the troubled history maybe um, of the utility and the tribe, I think there comes a, um, a desire to have a um, you know, a workable solution that that gives benefit to the, the Indian community and the proximity to the nuclear waste and the nuclear plant. They are um, very close. I think it's 700 yards. It's it's close. I don't want to say a number because I will get it wrong. But um, they're very close. And so it's because of that that this agreement has been born. And um, that's just what that is. Representative Novotny. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, once again, uh, we can walk across the river at, at uh, the dry part of the summer and, and go touch the bank at the Monticello side where the, where the facility is. And as I said, you can see it from our side of the river. No, oh, it's, it's 700 yards, that's, that's probably pretty fair. Um, with the issues going on at Monticello, you know, we're down river of them. Um, so I'll be looking for that bill and and uh, appreciate your support on that then. Thank you. Further discussion on the A16 amendment. Seeing no further discussion, the A16 as amended is now before the committee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. No. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. So to your bill as amended, Representative Acom. Thank you, Madam Chair. And what I will say is this is a really good bill. And um, it does a lot of good things for Minnesotans. Um, it recognizes the opportunity to make targeted investments in renewable energy to benefit Minnesotans and to decrease um, energy costs for people. It, it does it in a way that really focuses on low and middle income Minnesotans to ensure those that have historically been left out of this um, renewable energy transition uh, are a part of it and are an integral part of it. And um, so the, um, you know, climate justice provisions, um, the the renewable energy provisions, the, the policy, um, I know this is a fiscal committee, so I won't get too far into the policy, but um, there's a lot of policy as well that will um, make things better for Minnesotans and their energy costs more affordable. I urge your support. Discussion to the bill. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so when I was in committee, we had a long conversation about the section in here that was authored by Representative Bierman and it has to do with weatherization and pre-weatherization. And there's a lot of money, 45 million, uh, I believe it was the number in the bill. Can you just let this committee know, because we finally got basically to the definition in, um, in our committee, mostly born out of a testifier that kind of got us curious about it, but can you just explain $45 million is a big portion of this bill 
specifically for pre-weatherization. Can you just explain what pre-weatherization means and what we will be paying for now, we the taxpayers? Representative Acom. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I may ask uh, Mr. Eloff to um, join me. He was part of the conversation about that definition and he may be able to come up with a specific language. But what I will say is weatherization, uh, when we look at um, buildings and homes, 40% um, of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings. And so if we can make homes more efficient, um, they're healthier for people. And so investing in them to have be better outcomes, both in an environmental and a, a climate way are helpful as well. And it also impacts um, health. And so um, I think Mr. Eloff can get us the um, description or the definition that um, Representative O'Neill is referring to. Well, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Bob Eliff, House Research. Um, I don't have a definition per se. Um, in committee, uh, the Department of Commerce was testifying. Um, in the uh, ECO bill that was passed two years ago, there was a provision stating that the Commissioner of Commerce would uh, convene a task force to come up with a list of pre-weatherization measures. That has been done. That list, I think, was gone over a little bit during um, um, in, in, in committee. Um, one thing I will say to make it I mean, pre-weatherization, no, nobody knows what it means. There are some examples. Um, if you go to a home and there's a broken window, federal law prohibits you from using federal funds to do weatherization in that house. This bill allows state money to be used to fix that window so that federal funds can then be used to weatherize the house. Same thing in terms of if there's mold found in the house, federal law prohibits uh, federal funds being used to weatherize that house. This bill would allow that to happen. Uh, there's also a strange federal law that says the work must, if it, the work must be done in the same federal fiscal year. Um, this bill will allow that to be set aside and the weatherization to occur at any time. Those are the kinds of um, barriers there are right now because of federal law that would be addressed um, by this bill. And we were told by the Department of Commerce that um, I believe 40% of uh, the houses that uh, are on the list to be weatherized are rejected because of those federal laws. And this bill is attempting to uh, make it more possible for those houses to receive weatherization services. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Cha uh, Chair Acom and Mr. Eloff. Um, so I actually got a list from the Department of Commerce. Uh, it's a very long list and it includes things like decluttering. So if someone's ho house is hoarded, this money could go to remove the hoard to get to whatever needs to be weatherized. Um, as Mr. Eloff pointed out, it could be black mold remediation. So if black mold is throughout the house, it could be removing everything that has black mold on it and restoring all of that. If that black mold was caused by a pipe leak, which a lot of times it is, plumbing is included. If there's a, a roof leak, it includes the repair of the roof or a replacement of the roof. If the siding is bad, it, it just goes on and on and on. Literally anything that causes a house to be in disrepair that could limit it from doing what's considered weatherization would be included and now paid for by the taxpayer. And when I asked the Deputy Commissioner from, of Commerce that specific question, she really doubled down in my view that no, we absolutely need to do this. We've been walking away from these homes for too long and we need to which I'm assuming, and not, actually it's not 45 million, it's 46 million plus 10 million from RDA to do the pre-weatherization. So it, it is a big chunk of this um, bill. This bill overall has a 513% increase over base. It's a lot of money. This bill has a lot of money. This is a, a big portion of it. and. Um, you know, if that's what we want to do is we want to repair the entire house from top to bottom so that it can be weatherized, that's what this, you know, the $56 million actually does. 
So that's what that does. I'm wondering one other quick thing, because I, I know this is ways and means, but um, so the solar, uh, community solar gardens. Community solar gardens is one of the most expensive ways you could possibly produce energy, short of biomass, which we finally got rid of as um, that we were subsidizing it. But can you just tell the committee what we're doing to change community solar gardens? I was hoping we were going to eliminate it because it's an incredibly expensive program, unnecessarily expensive. Um, it increases rates. And if you ask Excel, which I'm not going to, they're here, but I'm not going to, it is uh, an ever increasing cost to the ratepayer. So I'm wondering if you could just explain to the committee what is the change. I was really hoping it was going to be eliminate because that would really be the right answer. But what are we doing with community solar gardens? Representative Acom. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative. And I'm just going to circle back to pre-weatherization. And the number one thing that is done in homes um, for pre-weatherization is vermiculite removal. And so this is um, not decluttering. It's not any of the things that maybe are included in some exhaustive list. Um, the vast majority of the funds are used um, for that, which are incredibly helpful for people living in those homes. Um, as far as your question about community solar, um, I, I think that as I stated, in committee and as I will say again, um, in Minnesota we have um, a need and a use for rooftop solar, smaller medium sized projects as well as utility scale solar. And so while I understand and have heard from many um, the concerns about the cost of the community solar program, um, I I want to, and, and I want to address that. Um, I think that we need to have a program that is cost effective and um, also fills this niche of a medium size um, solar array that can be placed throughout Minnesota in places where there's um, space available on our grid. And so the um, flexibility of community solar can be incredibly helpful. And in um, looking at comparing community solar costs to other forms of solar, like utility scale, um, oftentimes they are not taking into account the transmission that needs to be built to in order to um, take advantage of the larger solar. So I think that there are costs um, that um, maybe are eliminated or not looked at in, in one, but um, need to be when, when we look at the whole picture. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I appreciate that. I just wanted to know what, what you've changed in the bill and if you could let the committee know that. And, and I would say that even members of the PUC don't like community solar because they don't regulate it. So they don't get to have their stamp of approval on it. So there is that too. But if you could just tell us what the bill actually does to change community solar. Representative Acom. Um, well, the bill that is in within our bill um, that's in, before us today is expanding it to include all the public utilities, is increasing the size of the arrays from one kilowatt to five kilowatts. Um, and so there are um, changes that we have brought in and we will continue to have conversations with um, utilities and um, stakeholders as the process continues. We are um, making hurdles by going through ways and means and hopefully to the House floor and um, yet we don't um, adjourn for a while. We still have a lot of work and a lot of time to get work done. Representative O'Neill. Thank you Madam Chair. <clears throat> so you're <laughs> making a very expensive program expanded across the entire state not regulated by the PUC and not curtailing the cost. That's what I heard you say. I, just for that reason alone, I would be an absolute no on the bill. Thank you, Madam. Further discussion to the bill. Lead Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Aiken. Thank you for your work on this bill. Um, I do want to highlight for members a couple of things here on the fiscal spreadsheet. If you look um, on line 154, uh, these are numbers that are versus base. We see that there's an additional $12.4 million in electric vehicle rebates. This committee knows my long-standing objection to electric vehicles and how much I dislike them. <laughs> so, um, in seriousness, now, if you look at uh, line 163 at 20 million and 165 at the solar rewards withholding for 10 million, um, Madam Chair and members, these are programs that are already being heavily incentivized, subsidized, whatever language you want to use, from the federal level. The combination of those funds with these funds are ensuring that you're going to have projects that a majority of the funds will be coming from incentives and subsidies as opposed to 
um, actually having people paying for the cost of their programs. Uh, this bill is an extraordinary expansion in the size and scope of spending. Uh, whether you're looking at general fund, whether you're looking at what is a near doubling of the renewable development account spending uh, for the upcoming biennium. And it sets up a fiscal cliff for the ongoing biennium. Now, we should note, again, we're in the confines of a $17.5 billion budget surplus, and we have a majority party that is insisting on raising assessments, tax and fee taxes, and fees. That's with that environment. And so now when we look off into the tails into 25 and 26, we are supposed to believe that the DFL majority is suddenly going to find uh, and believe in fiscal austerity uh, going into the tails. Well, that ain't going to happen. Uh, if you're going to raise taxes with a surplus to fund a 40% increase in general fund spending, you're certainly going to be raising taxes to maintain that level of spending into the future. And this bill is the first of many that we will be seeing where we have an unsustainable pathway of government spending, an unprecedented expansion in unsustainable spending. I'll be voting no on this bill and will encourage members to do the same. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, I will go to Representative Acom for final words on your bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And um, I just want to address a couple of the things that were um, just mentioned by Representative Garofalo, and that's um, the RDA spending is higher this year because we didn't pass a bill last year. So there's a whole lot of work that went undone last year, and this um, bill has the opportunity to address that. So that's that. And then also you'll notice in so many places that um, this is one-time funding, and we put it in statute as one-time funding. This is not intended to be ongoing um, this is a, an opportunity where we can make a real difference and partner with the federal government to um, expand renewable energy, to uh, address climate change, and to do it in a way that brings low and moderate income Minnesotans along. So with that, um, I ask for your support. Thank you, Representative Acom. And with that, House File 2754, as amended, is laid over. So thank you. And now we're going to go to House File 2310, Representative Hansen. <laughs> so welcome to the committee, Representative Hansen. Good to see you. And I will move that House File 2310 be placed on the general register. And you also have two amendments. We'll get those amendments going so the bill is in the shape you'd like. So first, I will move the A18 amendment. Uh, would you please describe the A18 amendment? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the A18 amendment is the author's amendment. I'm going to quickly go through that. Lines 1.2 to 1.3 is a technical change requested by the PCA regarding a transfer of money to the University of Minnesota. Uh, lines 1.4 to 1.11 is adding the fiscal year appropriation for the Drill Corps Library to the bill. We'll be hearing that bill later uh, this evening uh, as well as another bill. Lines 1.12 to 1.113 uh, adds language to the Board of Water and Soil Resources Water Quality and Storage Practices Appropriation Rider to allow the money to be spent on the new Soil Health Practices Program established in the bill. Lines 1.14 to 3.21 adds an appropriation for the Met, to Met Council for a comprehensive plan for White Bear Lake drinking water. This is from House File 2304. Lines 3.22 to 32.5 uh, adds a provision saying that the appropriations in Article 1 for those uh, two uh, items I referenced, if it is enacted more than once during the 2023 session, uh, only one becomes law. Alliance 3.26 to 6.25 uh, replaces the odor management section with a revised version of the language. Alliance 6.26 to 7.30 modifies the cumulative impact section. Alliance 7.31 deletes the section increasing per diems for members of the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission. This is being carried in the Omnibus Legacy Bill. Alliance 7.32 to 8.31 adds two sections from the White Bear Lake Bill. Uh, and then lines 8.32 to 9.2 are technical corrections uh, suggested by staff. I'd ask for your support. Discussion to the A18 amendment. 
Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Representative Hanson, I recognize a few things here, like the uh, drill core library, which you mentioned we'll be hearing later. I think you've said in the dark of night. I might be misquoting you. I apologize. But my, my really my only question here is, uh, is uh, why couldn't we have heard these provisions in committee? I wish we'd had an opportunity to discuss some of these things there and just was wanting to know what the reasoning was. Representative Hansen. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Heinzman. I think actually all these, the White Bear Lake bill was heard and was sent separately to this committee. Um, and we were advised by staff that we needed to put those individual bills into the omnibus bill as well. So the Drill Corps Library, uh, the White Bear Lake bill, uh, the Bowser bill with soil health, we heard that uh, and we're incorporating that in. The technical changes, uh, the order management bill, uh, uh, took suggestions that were heard in testimony uh, during committee. Uh, the cumulative impacts uh, is on testimony that was heard in committee. And then um, the per diems is self-explanatory uh, uh, that was is being carried elsewhere. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Representative Hanson, I, maybe I should have been more specific. There's, there's definitely changes in, in a number of these. We'll just give, for example, the order management language that's in the A18. Maybe you could walk through some of the changes there if you would like, but there's, there are some things there that haven't been heard. And so that's why I was asking if there was a reason why it hadn't shown up in committee. Our omnibus uh, was, was heard and we were able to go through that um, just a week and a week or so ago. So um, if there was a issue with timing or otherwise, that's fine. But I, was just thought, I just thought maybe we could talk about that today. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Heinzman. As I said, uh, you know, we listened very closely uh, during the committee discussion. There were some concerns raised. One of the things we did was uh, remove, uh, provide an exemption for the pulp and paper industry. I think you heard that uh, concern that was raised during that. Uh, we also, there was questions about how uh, this could be provided uh, in terms of clarity and sort of certainty. So we added a section uh, relating to an order management plan. So that is the actionable uh, you'd have complaints and then the management plan and then maintenance to that management plan. So those are items that we heard in committee uh, and as the author have tried to accommodate those concerns and that is why it's in the author's amendment here. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. So what I'm hearing, Representative Hanson, is that the changes that have been made in the bill today were simply a response to discussion in committee. Uh, that's all well and good. I'm suggesting that I would have liked to have heard those changes in committee. Uh, there's a lot of policy here and a lot of changes that I think would have benefited from a discussion in committee. And so that's why I asked. Further discussion to the amendment. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the A18 amendment, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. no. The motion prevails and the A18 amendment is adopted. And there's one more amendment, the A17 amendment. So I will move the A17 amendment. And for members following along, this is the one we had discussion on last week, the grants management uh, piece that we've discussed that will be added on to all uh, budget bills. Representative Hansen, any discussion to the A17 amendment? Madam Chair, it's my understanding this is being added to all the bills, so I'd support it. Great. Any discussion to the A-17 amendment? Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Just one quick question. Um, line 1.15 is uh, just stating this is uh, an amendment working towards financial review of nonprofit grant recipients. Um, just wondering why we're not doing this for all grant recipients. So, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so specifically nonprofit grant recipients, I wanted to make sure that this could potentially uh, be changed to address all grant recipients as opposed to just nonprofits, Chair. Uh, Representative Heinzman, I maybe will turn to Mr. Sullivan if he has anything to say. We can talk about this as the Office of Grants Management Policy currently and was modeled after what we have there. And I can see if Mr. Sullivan can add, uh, provide a little more context to that. Madam Chair and members, uh, yeah, just to note that the language is specific to nonprofits currently. 
I think the the um, Office of Grants Management at the Department of Administration, their policy applies to grants generally, but, uh, and Representative, or Chair Hansen could comment to this, but I suspect that within most of the omnibus bills, the grants typically go to nonprofit organizations that provide a public service on behalf of the state. But that may not be true universally, but I suspect that's true for the most part. Representative Hansen, would you like to add anything to that? Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm putting on my Legislative Audit Commission hat, and I believe that um, we require the agencies to follow the Office of Grants Management. So if that's what we're, that's what you're looking for, Representative Heinzman, I, I believe they uh, have to comply with those requirements as the agency. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. I, Representative Hanson, I'm not entirely sure that, that that is the case, so that's why I was asking wanted to, to make sure that it's applied evenly between all those applying for grants. Maybe it's a discussion we can have offline. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Representative Heinzman. Any further discussion to the A-17 amendment? <clears throat> Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the A-17 amendment is adopted. And so to your bill, Representative Hanson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, members of the committee. House File 2310, as amended, is a problem-solving bill, uh, and it's dealing with problems that have accumulated uh, over time. And uh, those of us in the legislature have heard those, and many of the acronyms and many of the concerns over time. CWD, chronic wasting disease, EAB, emerald ash borer, AIS, aquatic invasive species, PFAS, polyfluoroalkaline substances, PFAS. Any of these uh, issues have been around for a long time. And when there is inaction for a long time, the costs increase. Prevention is better than cleanup in the environmental arena. And what we're trying to do here is prevent future problems, build the base on what we have right now of problem solving, and then uh, deal with some legacy problems some past problems, some of which have lingered back to the Palenti administration of restoring dollars that were taken then. Uh, it includes uh, 670 million above the February forecast base and matches the committee target included in the budget resolution. It provides funding for the MPCA of 233 million, DNR above base, DNR 472.8 million, the Board of Water and Soil Resources 98.7 million, Metropolitan Council Parks, 43.1 million. The Conservation Corps, 1.4 million. The Minnesota Zoo, uh, 27.8 million. And the Science Museum of Minnesota. It also brings in federal money. Uh, this includes uh, 24.7 million in federal Pittman Robertson reimbursements from qualified spending. Uh, there has money from the Aquatic Invasive Species Surcharge, 5.1 million. 14.8 million from watercraft registration fees, 6.3 million from a state park fee increase, 12.2 million from increased fishing license fees, uh, 1.7 million for feedlot financial assurance agreements, and 1.4 million for air toxics emissions reporting and rulemaking. This bill uh, also includes several sections. It has a policy section. It has spending uh, recommendations from the Legislative and Citizens Commission on Minnesota Resources on spending the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. It has uh, those appropriations. Uh, it provides uh, additional staffing in the agencies. Uh, but I want to highlight just a few of those acronyms. It provides $93 million in planting new trees and responding to emerald ash borer. That is roughly equivalent to what we spent on dealing with Dutch elm disease in the 1970s. Actually, it's a little bit low if you consider uh, inflation adjusted from that time. Emerald ash borer first was diagnosed in Minnesota in 2008-2009. As you drive around our state, you will find trees that are dying or have died all over the place. And we need to invest in taking down those trees trying to sustain some of the trees that have not died yet, and then also replanting trees of a variety of species and a variety of ages. What do we do with those trees when we collect them? We also provide money in there for disposing of those trees properly rather than improperly. Trees are 
an expensive but a long-term benefit in terms of climate. The appropriations that are in the bill provide for both private sector and public sector trees. We provide aquatic invasive species, 6.6 .6 million to the University of Minnesota AIS Research Center to take the work that we've invested in the lab into the lakes. We've invested a lot of money into research and how do we take that and implement that? How do we get tools into Minnesotans' hands to respond to aquatic invasive species? Chronic wasting disease we have dealt with for many years. We have a comprehensive package in this bill dealing with, with chronic waste and disease. PFAS, a variety of bills that have moved through the legislature in a variety of committees on dealing with PFAS uh, relating to that. Environmental justice, stronger protections for residents of environmental justice areas. Cumulative impacts, Representative Lee has worked on air toxics emissions and cumulative impacts for many years and the amendment we adopted continued to reflect changes that he has made based on input. MLCAT, this repays the Metropolitan Landfill Contingency Action Trust with interest. It was raided during the Palenti administration and doesn't have enough money to maintain and clean closed landfills. These are just some of the appropriations that are in the bill and I would stand for any questions. Thank you, Representative Hansen. Discussion to the bill. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Representative Hansen, a few of the things that I wanted to quickly uh, talk about. Uh, earlier when we were discussing the amendments and how they resulted from conversation in committee and working towards making the bill better, um, one of the things that continues to be a discussion, I think, across the state is a lot of the fee increases that are also here. And they're always couched, most of the correspondence that I've seen and the news stories couched against a $17.5 billion surplus. And I just wanted to quickly check and see um, if I could bring that up again today and uh, just hear from you as the bill author, is there any chance that we might see um, some uh, potential for change and seeing some of those fees to go fees go away. We're talking about increased park fees, watercraft licenses, AIS surcharge, fishing licenses, hunting licenses, and so on going up. And the cumulative impact is significant. So just once again raising that to a higher level discussion. And if you could address that, Representative Hansen, and maybe if there's a chance that that could change, um, I'd love to report that back. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Heinzman. Uh, as you know, uh, this budget area has a lot of dedicated dollars, dedicated with a small d. And uh, these user fees that are used uh, provide the services that are in those accounts. Um, the governor's budget and the agencies uh, made a case for these fees, not only for the short term, but for the long term. Um, and I do have the agencies here, maybe particularly uh, for the DNR, if I could have uh, Commissioner Meyer to just highlight a little bit of those fees uh, uh, to get those on the record and why they're needed. Welcome to the committee, Commissioner. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. For the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Representative Hansen and his committee for this bill that we've worked on to get to this point. And it is true, there are fees contained in this bill. There are also millions and millions of dollars of general fund infrastructure needs within our system that these the fee increases will support. For example, there's $35 million for our public hatcheries, our fish hatcheries, that will be supported by a modest $5 fishing license fee increase to continue providing staffing for uh, lake, lake surveys, Creel census work and other work that's needed to manage our lakes to ensure that the fish that we're growing to put in those lakes will survive and, and need to be there. The state park fee increases, uh, which is a modest fee increase for the state parks, are matched with $25 million general fund infrastructure needs, uh, assessment, re rehabilitation, and repair for our state park system that we haven't seen for a long time. Those dollars are also matched by appropriations within the bonding bill. So the approach that we've taken and the, the committee has, has supported is 
large general fund infrastructure support within the budget, followed by fee increases of a modest nature to help support that work into the into the future. So for the park system, for example, increasing those park permit fees will allow us more staff to take care of the infrastructure work that we're going to be doing. New shower buildings, new trailhead uh, uh, opportunities, new um, accessibility work. Our accessibility work in our parks are going to be amazing. William O'Brien will be the first park in our system in a few years to be completely accessible from general fund in, in, improvements, legacy funds improvements from Chairman Lilly's bill and the, the fees that we're increasing. So it's not just increasing the fees to increase fees. It's increasing the fees to support the large generational investments that are contained in this bill. And we want to thank you all and thank Representative Hansen for doing that. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner. Representative Feinsman. Thank you, Chair. And uh, uh, maybe since uh, Commissioner Meyer is, is here, I could uh, quickly check and see uh, about there's a particular uh, proposal that isn't included in the bill, invasive carp. Was a, was a bill that we were hearing this last year that would get at some of the questions that we've had as to how we might prevent that uh, invasive carp from coming upstream in Minnesota. And I believe that that language is missing. If I'm mistaken, I apologize, but I think that that is. And is there, if, could we just, it's a fairly large bill. So is that there? Is the invasive carp barrier there in the bill or not? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Heinzman. We did not include the $17 million one-time appropriation for infrastructure on leased property uh, in this bill. Uh, our estimates are that there would also be ongoing operations, which would probably take even more fee increases if you were going to maintain that. We don't have tails in the bill. So if you build it, uh, you also have to maintain it, and then you have to operate it. So we did not feel that was important uh, to do that appropriation at this time. Instead, we have the $6.6 .6 million for the labs to lakes appropriation to take the implementation uh, of the research that we have done to deal with invasive species. Representative Heinzman. That's all for now. Thank you, Chair. Any further discussion to the bill? Uh, Madam Chair, if you could just ask the audience and there's some kind of somebody's playing a video or something okay. it's really hard to Thank hear you. Um, I thought I was going crazy <laughs> <laughs> I do there we're getting some sort of feedback from over here so okay it's been taken care of thank you thank you madam chair yes well madam chair both those statements could Can be true yeah. <laughs> watch it represent <laughs> and now I'd like to speak in your committee <laughs> okay great uh, further discussion to the bill Lead Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Hansen. Uh, first of all, I do want to compliment you on a couple items in the bill. First of all, um, you made sure that the uh, landfill fund was uh, restored, uh, that full balance. You just want to talk about that a little bit. It's $29 million, right? So I just thank you for doing that. I think that's a good priority. I also wanted to highlight, um, and it's a small item, but something I was hoping we'd see more of is that you have, uh, for the Science Museum, you highlight some reduction in admission fees. Um, now, when I read the language of the bill, maybe you amended this, but it didn't specify how much the, redu the reduction in admission fees were. But obviously, the lower those costs are, the more people would be able to go into the Science Museum and utilize that service. Do you have, do you have any plans for how much of that is going to be is going to result in that? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Garofalo. Just to give you a little context, uh, the Science Museum has uh, some significant debt, and the appropriation would reduce that debt. And then those debt service payments can go to help hire back the employees that were laid off uh, recently and also reduce uh, those costs for... Uh, my son uh, just w uh, went to the science. It's $30 uh, to go in. So if we can reduce those, uh, there is someone here uh, representing the Science Museum who can talk a little bit about their plan. But uh, Representative Garofalo, if you want to... If you need more clarity or more detail on that, our intent is reduce the debt, allow those debt, what would be going to debt, to be ongoing money, hire back the folks that were laid off, and then reduce the, the fees to make it more affordable for Minnesotans. Madam. Representative Graff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Hansen. And I just, I would hope that, I suspect we're not going to see a lot of that, but it's just a way that people are able to use government services without having to pay more. And that's kind of one of the things we should be doing more of. 
with the size of the budget surplus. Um, also, in our packet, and I haven't done any fact checking on this, but there's a letter from a Stephanie Chappelle. Have you seen this? This letter? Um, I have not. Okay. Just if you could just pull the letter to the side, we don't need to talk about it now. Can you just read the letter and get back to me and tell me if, I mean, there's some concerning items in this letter, but I haven't, I haven't fact checked the source or verified the information, but if you could. Madam Chair, I could follow up with Representative Graffel. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm Representative Graffel, anything? So, yeah, thank okay. you. Um, so, uh, Representative Hanson, so getting back on the bill, $17.5 billion surplus. You've heard the concerns about fees. Why couldn't we have fund those operating costs, costs from the surplus? The governor several times took portions of the surplus, put them into special revenue accounts for four years to fund those things out. Why aren't we doing that instead of raising fees? Representative Hanson. Madam Chair and Representative Garofalo, so let me clarify a little bit. We are funding the operating, uh, the existing operating with the bill. So we're providing for the full operating services. But when we are investing into things, it takes more money to continue servicing those things. And we don't have tails. So the $670 million, there's $90 million in tails. Of that, about $75 million is for operating for the staff that is there. There is additional dollars that are needed with these dedicated dollars to make sure in those particular fee-driven accounts and the services that they provide that they cover those costs. So, Rep Representative Graffalo. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Hanson. Uh, there, there's no doubt the taxpayers are definitely being serviced by the DFL this session. There's, there's no doubt about that. But can you tell me, I don't understand why you can't use the surplus to fund these costs as opposed to reaching into taxpayers' pockets and getting more revenue into the system. They have, we, state has an unprecedented amount of money. Can't, it is true that we could use those, we could use those funds to uh, fund those instead of the fees, right? I mean, that we do have that option available to us. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Garofalo, where we can use one-time money, we do. And we actually extend it for four years in most cases. So that is more ongoing. But when we are providing for things, we can pay for a thing. Paying for people costs more and it's ongoing. Um, Madam Chair, Representative uh, Hansen, um, it's a finance committee, not policy related, but um, you uh, accomplished something that you've included in this bill, some policy provisions that were even too much for Governor, New Gav Governor Gavin Newsom out in California, and he vetoed. And his concerns with that were the ongoing uh, enforcement of those costs. Do you have any concerns about the enforcement of the, uh, the PFAs, PFAS, the PFAS uh, provisions that you have in your bill? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Garofalo. We have a number of PFAS provisions. I think as we go into conference, there will be continual discussion about those provisions. We have things that are different than California. I'm interested that you are concerned about California uh, requirements. Uh, maybe we can have that discussion. But there are, there are things in here that I believe we need to do. Um, and I believe there does need to be some additional clarification. But I can tell you from my district and from members all around our state, the concern about PFAS is real, uh, and the desire that we do something now is significant. So we have to work. I'd be happy to work with you on how to make the bill better. Um, we have a ways to go, but there are things that we need to do. Madam Chair, Representative, Representative Hanson, uh, just a final question here. So you had mentioned in your comments about these are meant to solve problems. A lot of these things are one time in money. Um, is it your intent that this would build a base for future spending, or is this truly one time money that you won't need to spend money on in the future? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Graffalo. I'll use as an example the trees. I, I hope we don't have to come back and spend $93 million on trees. I hope that we don't have to do that. Um, we, we look at what happened with Dutch elm disease. With over a two or three year period, we've resolved some of that. How do we dispose of them? How do we handle that? Um, we hope that the money that's in here and making that appropriation available is enough. I don't want to come back and do that again. I don't want to come back and have to refill the MLCAT account again uh, with landfills. Uh, I'm hopeful that we have resolved the chronic waste and disease. We've spent years debating that. 
So these one-time dollars, and just on that, we are going back and repurposing some of the money that had not been spent on chronic waste and disease to use this time. So uh, your, the answer is, I hope not. I'm hoping that we can resolve some of these, and that's the intent is to, to deal with it. We've waited too long on several of these, and the cost has gone up. The longer we wait, the more the cost will go up. We need to resolve them now. Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Hanson. Thanks for those comments. Um, I just will highlight for members the absolute unsustainable path we have on spending here. Um, what our, it's, it's really, it's awful. <laughs> um, the massive increase in size and scope of spending and the permanent infrastructure uh, that is being built around a larger government. Um, it, it is unsustainable, not from a political perspective, but from a mathematical perspective. And this, uh, and your your bill is in that pathway of unsust um, unsustainability. So I'll be voting no and would encourage other people to do the same. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, Representative Hansen, final word on your bill. I appreciate the discussion and the comments. Uh, uh, this is a problem solving bill. Many of these problems have been around for a long time. Prevention is better than cleanup. I ask uh, you to join us on this journey of preventing future problems and solving these past problems and ask for your support. Thank you, Representative Hansen. So we're gonna have a series of motions now to merge the two bills. So the first here is Representative Acom, would you move that the language contained in House File 27, 2754 as amended be incorporated into the Environment, Natural Resource, Climate and Energy Bill as a separate article? Thank you, Madam Chair, that is my motion. Great, any discussion to the motion? <laughs> Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. 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 The motion is adopted. So now to the next motion, I move that the language in House File 2310 as amended be incorporated into the Omnibus Environment, Natural Resources, Climate and Energy Bill as a separate article. Any discussion to that motion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. No. The motion prevails. So now we are on final passage of the bill as amended. So I renew my motion that House File 2310 as amended be placed on the general register and that nonpartisan staff be directed to make technical changes as necessary. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, Please say no. 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 The motion prevails and House File 2310 as amended has been placed on the general register. Thank you, Representative Hanson. You also have the next bill. And so I will move that House File 2105 be re-referred to the general register. And we have uh, two amendments here. So the A3 amendment, I will move the A3 amendment. Would you like to describe that amendment? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the A3 amendment uh, was discussed in the uh, Environment and Natural Resources Finance Committee. Uh, it is a provision relating to the city of Duluth. We did not include it when it was in the committee, and we said we had to check with the bonding committee to see if this needed to go in the bonding bill or whether it needed to be in uh, this bill. We received uh, information late yesterday from MMB, so we have this as a separate amendment. Uh, we did discuss it in committee, uh, and uh, so I would ask for your support. It relates to uh, a cemetery area, uh, and we're returning some land. Uh, thank you, Representative Hanson. So I maybe made a mistake. Did I move the... I think you're describing the A4, but I may have moved the A3. Oh no, that's you're, do, you're doing it correctly. Just ignore me. <laughs> St. Louis County in Duluth, it was, yep. Okay, so you described the A3, the A3 is in front of us, all things check out. So any discussion to the A3 <laughs> amendment? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the A3 amendment is adopted to the A4 amendment, and I will move the A4 amendment. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. The A4 amendment was brought to us by uh, the DNR and uh, St. Louis County, and 
maybe if they could just describe the the amendment it came after the lands bill went through committee it's my understanding there is agreement on this hi welcome to the committee please introduce yourself for the record and proceed Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members. Uh, my name is Susan Damon. I'm Assistant Director for Lands in the DNR Division of Lands and Minerals. The uh, proposed A4 amendment uh, would enable the DNR and St. Louis County to uh, undertake a large land exchange with the Conservation Fund, which is also working together with Ecosystem Investment Partners on a wetland banking project. And it involves uh, over 6,000 acres of land, uh, both school trust land that is administered by the DNR, uh, county tax forfeited land, and some county fee land. And uh, the amendment is needed uh, because there are commercial quantities of peat that are otherwise withdrawn from sale um, and so we have uh, a provision that allows uh, a, a conveyance of peat to go forward. Uh, there are also some riparian restrictions in the land exchange laws, and this would uh, also allow those uh, uh, the exchange to go forward without the, uh, despite the res riparian restrictions. And finally, uh, there's a limit on the value. The values in a land exchange of this size uh, can only um, be a difference of 110 percent and the DNR in St. Louis County have negotiated an agreement with the Conservation Fund and e Ecosystem Investment Partners uh, that the, uh, the school trust fund and the um, county tax forfeited funds would receive 125 percent of, of value from the exchange partner. Thank you. Discussion to the A4. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. And this is going to be, I guess, a theme on the environment stuff today in committee. But this is a pretty significant uh, amendment. And generally, the lands bill is very non controversial. Is there any reason that this also was not heard in committee? And I'm I'm struggling to understand exactly what we're trying to get at here and why this couldn't have been heard sooner. Repres Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Heinzman, I defer to DNR on that. We just received it. Ms. Damon. Madam Chair, Representative Garofalo, um, the parties were still negotiating this agreement uh, at the time the lands bill was heard. And so we did not know until very recently that we would be able we would be able to reach an agreement and go forward with this proposed land exchange. Representative Heinzman. Chair, I, I, I'm assuming that I would likely fail in this effort, but this seems like something that should go back to committee. I understand that there may have been an issue in terms of timing, but it would be really nice to be able to have a chance to better understand what's going on in this amendment. That would be my suggestion. Until it's heard in committee, I would I would be a no vote today uh, on the amendment going on. Further discussion, to Rep Representative Garofalo. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Hansen. Um, I, I respectfully have been told here about the that there were negotiations going on. It sounds like an agreement was reached after the fact. The agency came to you. I mean, is there any way you can just post a public hearing on this bill and then you could amend this on the floor? If if, if this is as non-controversial as it's being presented, you're not going to have any complaints from us. It's just, I think, you know, there's a, there were some problems before in lands bills when <laughs> somebody showed up with a, an amendment that wasn't vetted and it caused some significant problems. I'm not alleging that's the case here, but that's why we have hearings on stuff so we know, not, not as kind of to protect ourselves. Um, is that, is there something we can do with this as opposed to putting this on today? Is that an, is that an option? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I, I want to be clear that I didn't know about the negotiations prior to this uh, being presented. And so uh, this is new. Uh, the agency came to me. What I would, uh, and I'm just making this up as I'm here, but what I would Aren't like to all? do, <laughs> what, I, what I would like to do, uh, Madam Chair, is that 
this is out here. It was posted yesterday. Um, and that if we, the bill is not going to be heard until next week. Um, and so it's out in public. You've raised concerns. Um, I think it'll be hard to have a hearing, but I'm, I'm confident that if there are folks that are concerned about this, uh, they're going to contact us and we'll get some indication here between now and when the time comes. So what I would do is withdraw the amendment. Uh, if we are able to put it on non-controversially, if that's a word, uh, on the floor, uh, you know, I would be open to that. Yeah. Representative Heinzman. Madam Chair, thank you. Representative Hansen, that would be really helpful and uh, sincerely appreciated. Thank you. Representative Hansen, do you want to, do you, would you like to do that? Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, you know, I was hopeful that we would get a uh, consent calendar on the, uh, on the lands bill, uh, like we almost did on the last one. So I will withdraw the amendment. Um, I think we've had a public discussion with a commitment uh, to look at this and, um, you know, Madam Chair, if that's okay with you. Okay. So I, I will withdraw the amendment on the chair's behalf. So the A4 amendment has been withdrawn. And so now we are to the underlying bill as amended. So further discussion to the bill. Representative Feinsman. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to repeat myself, but uh, this is a generally non-controversial bill and uh, continues to be so. Uh, I support the bill and appreciate the uh, consideration on the previous amendment. Great. And with that, Representative Hansen, any further discussion to your bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. I was looking or listening carefully to the consent agenda discussion, but I might have missed it. I guess we'll we'll see in that. But I would ask for your support. The uh, I think the accommodation we've made is reasonable um, to have fuller vetting of this amendment. And uh, I think the lands bill discussion as it is, is it's a good bill. Um, we need to get back in the habit of uh, routinely processing these bills. They're part of the system of government that we need to do. So I'd ask for your support. Thank you, Representative Hanson. So I renew my motion that House File 2105 as amended be re-referred to the General Register. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and House File 2105 as amended has been re-referred to the General Register. So the last bill on the calendar for the day, and we have five minutes, and I think we can do it because we had some discussion about it already, is House File 2324, Representative Hansen. So I will move that House File 2324 be re-referred to the General Register. To your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. House File 2324 is the Drill Corps Library. Uh, this is an appropriation in this fiscal year. The building is currently closed because of safety concerns. I'd ask for your support. Any discussion to House File 2324? Seeing no discussion, I move, I renew my motion that House File 2324 be re-referred to the General Register. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and House File 2324 has been re-referred to the General Register. So that concludes our business for the day. We are on again for 9 a.m. tomorrow morning and look forward to seeing you then. We are adjourned.